Hello, I am Miss Janet, and today we're going to have the first lesson in a two-part on King Jehoshaphat. Our song will be, Thou Art a Wonderful God. Our scripture day comes from 1 Kings chapters 18 through 21 and 2 Chronicles chapters 17 through 19. In those days in Judah, there were no TVs, radios, internet, newspapers, mail, or any kind of communications besides what one person spoke to another. Sometimes an official would shout news in the town square. One day in Judah, People were saying to one another, King Asa died yesterday. He was a good king. His son Jehoshaphat is now king. I wonder what kind of king he will be. Word quickly spread throughout the country of Judah. Second Chronicles 17, verse 1. Jehoshaphat, Asa's son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. Strengthened himself against Israel indicates that Israel was considered an enemy. Israel was ruled by a wicked King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who may be the most evil woman in the Bible. Jehoshaphat built up defenses, he built up cities and such, to guard the border of Judah to protect them from their enemies. Jehoshaphat was a good king. Verse 3, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. That was his ancestor. That was a number of generations back. Going on, he did not seek the Baals, idols, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the practices of Israel. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat and he had great riches and honor. His heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord. And furthermore, he took the high places and the ashtrim, idols, out of Judah. Verse 7, in the third year of his reign, he sent his officials and with these Levites, the priests, and they taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. Copies of the Bible were written by hand on specially treated animal skins. They were very expensive and very few existed. Most towns maybe had no portions of God's word or only a couple small pieces. Priests and government officials traveled around reading God's word and teaching the people. Verse 10, And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms and the lands that were around Judah, and they made no war against Jehoshaphat. When you obey God, it changes your life. His enemies brought him presents of money and animals so he wouldn't attack them. Verse 12, And Jehoshaphat grew steadily greater. He built in Judah fortresses and store cities, and he had large supplies in the cities of Judah. He had soldiers and mighty men of valor in Jerusalem. And it goes on to get the numbers. And when you add them all up, he had 1,180,000 soldiers that were armed for war. 19. These were in the service of the king, besides those whom the king had placed 
in the fortified cities throughout all Judah. King Jehoshaphat was a powerful, wealthy king, and his kingdom was secure. The Bible tells us he had reigned for 17 years, and he kind of lost his edge for the Lord. He wasn't as careful because he got to thinking and making plans without asking God. Bad decision. Remember who a true prophet was. He was someone who spoke for Almighty God. There were false prophets of idols in those days, and we still have false teachers today. Because our Bible was not finished, prophets were needed to give the people new information from God. If what a prophet said was going to happen didn't happen, it was the death penalty. One had to be absolutely accurate when one spoke for God. The prophets could also preach, explain the instructions God had previously given to his people. We don't need prophets today because we have the completed Word of God, the Bible. But we do have preachers and teachers who explain to us what God has already said in his Word. Although Elijah isn't the main prophet in today's lesson, his prophecy concerning the destruction of King Ahab and his line of descendants comes true in the smallest sad detail in today's lesson. After Elijah told Ahab he would die and all his boy children and boy grandchildren would be killed, Ahab repented and God said the judgment wouldn't happen in Ahab's lifetime. Three years later, Ahab was back to his old ways. This was God's description of King Ahab. 1 Kings 21 verse 25. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. Incited is encouraged or egged on. We'll use the term the person incited to a riot. It's uh, incited is always used in a bad way. Good King Jehoshaphat of Judah decided to make friends with the country to the north, Israel. Since the people of both countries were from the same ancestors, he thought they should be closer. However, King Ahab were, and Israel worshipped idols, and King Jehoshaphat and the country of Judah worshipped the one true God. Jehoshaphat had been king of Judah for 17 years and should have had more wisdom by now, but he didn't. King Ahab hated God's word and his true prophets, like Elijah and Micaiah, who we meet in today's story. But King Jehoshaphat loved God and tried to follow his words. Our memory verse is 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? A yoke is an ancient device used to connect two animals together so they could use their combined strength to pull a plow, a wagon, turn a grinding wheel, or whatever needed to be done. It only made sense to use two animals of the same kind and size. I found this picture of a camel and a burro on the internet. For some poor guy, this may be all that he had, but I don't think it worked very well. The same would be for an oxen and a donkey. They're not the same size or weight, it just doesn't work well. When Paul wrote 2 Corinthians 6.14, he was talking about commitments people make, business partnerships, marriage commitments, as well as your friends. Who one goes to war with is also very important, as we discover in today's lesson. It doesn't go well when a believer and follower of God joins with someone who doesn't believe in or follow the Lord God. 2 Kings 22 For three years Syria and Israel continued without war, but in the third year, that was since Elijah's prediction of Ahab's death, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. It could have been at this time that the two kings arranged a marriage between Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah, and Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram. She turned out to be evil, just like her parents. And when her husband, the king of Judah, died, and then her son, Ahaziah, 
She tried to murder all of the remaining sons and grandsons so she could be queen of Judah. God spared one son, Joash, who later became king of Judah. Verse 3, And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and we keep quiet, and do not take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he turned to Jehoshaphat, sitting next to him, and said, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Ramoth Gilead was a city that originally belonged to Israel, but Ben-Hadad had captured it and not given it back when God had given Ahab a victory over Ben-Hadad and the Syrian army. Jehoshaphat's army could have been much larger than Ahab's. It was at least as big, so it was a big help to Ahab to have Jehoshaphat and his army. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, uh, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. It is always a good idea to ask God for wisdom and help when you have an important decision to make. But truthfully, we should ask him for wisdom each day. Jehoshaphat had no business going to war with an evil man like King Ahab, who worshipped idols and murdered his own people. What does our memory verse say? 2 Corinthians 6.14 Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Verse 6 Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? That's not go. And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here another prophet of the Lord whom we may inquire? These prophets claimed to be prophets for the one true God, but something just didn't seem right. They were just trying to make King Ahab happy to get stuff from him. King Jehoshaphat had heard enough true prophets in his own country that what these men were saying just didn't sound right. There are false teachers today who are working for Satan. If we spend time in God's word, he will help us recognize these false teachers who are not speaking the truth about God. Wisely, King Jehoshaphat asked for a second opinion, a real prophet of the Lord God. Verse 8, And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Amala. But I hate him. For he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Jehoshaphat's response was very weak. Ahab's statement should have been a real warning that something was very wrong. Verse 9. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah of Amala. Now, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes, at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. Important business was conducted at the city gate in those days. It was the center of commerce because people would be entering in the city with their things to sell or such. Verse 11, And Zedekiah, the son of Chanana, made for himself horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, with these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so and said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. These 400 false prophets were putting on quite a show for the two kings. Verse 13, and the messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophet with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them, and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that will I speak. The messenger said, Everybody was telling Ahab to go to war and he would win. Micaiah should join the crowd. Micaiah was a true prophet of God and would only speak what God told him to say. Going with the crowd is often the wrong thing to do. Verse 15, And when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain, that is, not go? 
And Micaiah answered him, Go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Swear is taking an oath that you are telling the truth, like one does in court in this case. It was obvious to King Ahab that the prophet Micaiah was speaking sarcastically or in a way that clearly said he didn't mean what he was saying. Ahab wanted to know the truth, but he didn't want to obey it. Knowing God's will is not enough. We have to obey it. Verse 17, And Micaiah said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. No master meant no king. He was saying that the king would be killed and the people of Israel scattered. Verse 18, And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? Micaiah then told a make-believe story to try and get Ahab's attention. In it, God asks how Ahab can be persuaded to attack Ramoth Gilead and die as predicted by God through Elijah the prophet. The winning answer is for the false prophets to tell Ahab it is safe for him to go to battle and he will win. Micaiah finished the story with verse 23. Now therefore behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. Almighty God doesn't need to anyone to help him figure out what to do. He knows everything. It was just a story. God's mercy for Ahab and his sin had come to an end. It was time for judgment. Some people think that they will live their lives as they wish and then come to Jesus before they die so they get to go to heaven. But we never know when we're going to die. People die in accidents every day. Verse 24. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chanana, came near and struck Micaiah on his cheek and said, How did the Spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Behold, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide yourself. That would be when the king was defeated and all his prophets were running for shelter. And the king of Israel said, Seize Micaiah and take him back to the governor of the city and said, Thus saith the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him meager, that's small, rations of bread and water until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, If you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Hear all you people. Micaiah wanted the people gathered there to remember God's words. King Jehoshaphat still foolishly agreed to go to battle with King Ahab. He didn't want to embarrass himself by refusing to go, but it almost cost Jehoshaphat his life. Verse 29, So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you wear your robes. King Ahab thought a change of clothes could protect him from the judgment of Almighty God? I don't think so. He was making Jehoshaphat the victim, or fall guy as we sometimes say. Verse 31. Now the king of Syria had commanded the thirty-two captains of his chariots, Fight with neither small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. And when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, It is surely the king of Israel. So they turned to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out, and when the captains of the chariot saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from following him. God graciously saved Jehoshaphat from his reckless, foolish actions in agreeing to fight with King Ahab. Once Ben-Hadad's soldiers realized it wasn't King Ahab, they left King Jehoshaphat alone as he was not their target. Verse 34, But a certain man drew his bow at random meaning he put an arrow in his bow and he pulled it back up and he let it go. There is nothing random in the plan of Almighty God. He plans down to the smallest detail. The scripture goes on, and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate with the arrow. Therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and carry me out of the battle for I am wounded. 
and the battle continued that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians. The king was propped up in his chariot, so it looked as if he was still directing the battle. His presence kept the soldiers fighting. And scripture goes on. Until at evening he died, and the blood of the wound flowed into the bottom of the chariot. And about sunset a cry went through the army, Every man to his city, and every man to his country. Those were the exact words of the prophet Micaiah had said in his prediction. Verse 37, So the king died and was brought to Samaria. And they buried the king in Samaria, and they washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood according to the word of the Lord that he has spoken. What God says comes true. King Ahab's death was God's judgment for his sin. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Sowing is planting, like seeds, and reaping means to harvest, the results of planting the seed. If you follow God's way and do what is right, God will bless you. If you do what is wrong, you will eventually pay the price, either in this life or after you die. King Ahab was dead and buried, and later Jezebel died as God had predicted she would through the prophet Elijah. Jehoshaphat headed home to Judah. 2 Chronicles 19, verse 1. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned in safety to his house in Jerusalem. But Jehu, the son of Hananiah the seer, that's the prophet, went out to meet him and said, King Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. Nevertheless, some good is found in you, for you destroyed the Ashtoreth, the idols, out of the land, and have set your heart to seek God. God did not want Jehoshaphat to go to Israel. But Jehoshaphat never asked God what he should do. And God is telling Jehoshaphat he has sinned. What should we do if we sin? 1 John 1 9 tells us what to do when we, as a child of God, sin. The Bible says in 1 John 1 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God will forgive us our sins. However, we might be stuck with the consequences of our sin. You ride your bicycle out into the street without looking, you got hit by a car. God will forgive you. Your parents will forgive you, but you may be stuck with a broken leg. And you, you speed, uh, you have an accident, you get hurt, uh, you lose money by spending it on something foolish, you hurt other people's feelings. Sometimes we embarrass ourselves, our friends, our parents with the things we do. Don't ever plan to sin and figure on asking God forgiveness afterwards, because there are consequences. To sin. But back to Jehoshaphat's reforms. After the prophet or the seer told him he had sinned, Jehoshaphat turned back to the Lord. Verse 4 of chapter 19. Jehoshaphat lived at Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. He appointed judges in the land of all the fortified cities of Jerusalem, city by city, and said to the judges, Consider what you do, for you judge not for man, but for the Lord. He is with you, giving judgment. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God, or partiality, or taking bribes. He's reminding them, God is looking on you when you make your decisions. And he is. You may think, I have never done anything as bad as killing people like Ahab and Jezebel or going to war with someone who doesn't follow God like Jehoshaphat did. But the Bible tells us in Romans 3.12, no one does good, not even one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ahab and Jezebel did so many terrible sins, we can't count them. But God's standard is absolute perfection. We all sin. We can't meet God's standard. Romans 6.23 tells us the result of our sin. 
for the wages of sin is death. Now comes the good news. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Death is separation. Separation from God and His wonderful home called heaven forever. Our sin had to be paid for. So Jesus paid for our sin when He died on the cross to pay the penalty or the cost of our sin. To prove He was God and had paid for our sin, He came back to life three days later. We celebrate that at Easter. Now we must tell Jesus we accept His free gift, just like you accept any gift. In this case, you reach out with your mind rather than your hands and accept it. Ask Jesus to forgive your sin and send His Holy Spirit to live with you. Salvation is free to us, but it costs the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, His life. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this story that reminds us there is a price to pay for sin, but you paid the price for our sin if we will accept you as our Savior. And if there's a, someone who has never done it today, they can pray, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin and coming back to life to prove you had done it. I ask you now to come into my life with your Holy Spirit and lead and guide me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a great week and may God richly bless you. If you would subscribe to our videos, it will be easier for you to find us all of them. Please click on the thumbs up if you like the video. We have a list of their stories and their web addresses, so it is easy to simply copy and paste the address in your browser to immediately get the story. Email us at Bible Stories by Ann and Janet at gmail.com. Goodbye.